for all of you here that are in person. Those of you who are joining us online, I'm glad you're spending your Mother's Day with us here at, at Bridge Church. And as I was thinking about like mothers and Mother's Day, because we all have one. We all have one. That's why you're here. And if you don't, then that's a conversation I want to have with somebody. But um, there's two things. As, as Jesus was, was being crucified, you realize that some of the last words that he uttered were to make sure that Mary was taken care of. He looked at John, he said, behold your mother. He was taking care of mama. Like that's, that's, something, that's something powerful. And you know what? Like we go through these seasons as, as kids and like we get to a certain age and we don't think our parents know anything. Do you know? It's like, I know everything. I don't know what and when you were created and you don't know nothing. And then we get a little bit older and we're like, hey, maybe they know some stuff. And then we get a little bit older and then there's some things or like behaviors that we go, ooh, I think I got that from them. It, you know what? In all of that, my prayer is that as we become older and more mature, that we would extend that much more grace to our parents. And on this Mother's Day, our moms. That we would extend grace to them. And everybody's got their stories, but I'll tell you this, your mom did the best she could because you know what didn't come with you when she left the hospital? A manual. <laughs> and you weren't that easy. You weren't that easy to figure out. And so moms, thank you. Thank you for all the things that you got right and things. Thank you for the ways that you tried and for those um, and everything in between. Um, I just pray that we can honor moms on this Mother's Day. And so if you've got a device or an old school Bible, meet me in the New Testament in the book of Luke. We're going through the first gospel in this chronological walk through the New Testament. In this book in which Luke writes a Gentile, a Gentile physician writes to other Gentiles who are just non-Jewish people about who Jesus is. And like last week we saw, he begins to emphatically tell us who Jesus is before he gets into any of the details about what Jesus has done. So we're gonna pick back up in that this week. We're gonna be in chapters, if you wanna go ahead and know, we're gonna be in chapters three and four this morning, all right, three and four. So the summer of my junior year in high school, I, I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, and so the summer of my junior year of high school, a handful of me and my buddies decided uh, that we were gonna go whitewater rafting, okay? And I'd done a little whitewater rafting before, but this time we decided we were gonna, take a road, we were gonna make a road trip out of it, all right? And so we got in the car and we headed three and a half hours north Three and a half hours north from Charlotte lands you right into like West Virginia. And West Virginia has got the New River. The New River is, is wicked. You may remember there's the New River Gorge and there was like a Ford truck commercial like decades ago where they like launch it off and it's like a bungee drop off it. That's the New River Gorge, uh, which they actually did that. And so we're going up there and we're gonna go whitewater rafting. And uh, before you go whitewater rafting, you go through this whole briefing of what that's gonna look like and what that's gonna require, and you meet your river guide. And the first thing he said is, one, there's going to be challenges. You're like, all right, break it down for us. And he's like putting helmets and, and you know, vests and all this stuff so that you know, we don't drown. And he's like, all right, so I just wanna let you know. He goes, here's what the river looks like ahead of you. Um, there's whirlpools in that river where you could get stuck in and sucked down, but don't worry, it'll spit you back up. Okay, um, starting to question whether this is a good idea. Uh, he's like, there's lots of rocks, and he goes, so if you fall out, uh, and there's a good likelihood that you might, he goes, be sure to, to point your feet down river and keep them together. And I was like, <laughs> I remember one of my buddies was like, why keep them together? And he goes, I'll let you figure that out on your own. I was like, oh, okay, good. I'm glad he asked it, and I did. And he goes, there's also things called hydraulics on the river. And we're like, what's a hydraulic? And a hydraulic is like a, a big rock where the water goes over, but then as it goes over, it continues to tumble. And so he's like, you know, if you fall out in that, it's gonna kind of keep you sucked under for a second, but it will spit you up, but it's gonna be kind of like freaky. But don't worry, if you fall out in some of these like precarious places, somebody is going to throw you a rope, and all you gotta do is reach out and grab that rope. These guys are really trained, it's gonna work out, you're gonna be fine. He goes, but there's going to be challenges. And when I say that, there's like category three and category four rapids. 
Now, I'd never been on something like that, but what he said next, what he said next in the midst of all the challenges brought a great degree of comfort. He was like, look, as long as you listen to everything I tell you, listen to what I say, you're gonna have a great day and we're all gonna have fun. I wanted to believe him. And then what he said next, he goes, this might be your first time down the river, but it's not mine. I've been down this river before. I know it. And I'm able to guide you and direct you, but you've got to listen to me and you've got to trust me. And so from that point, in the face of challenges, I really had a sense of comfort because of his expertise and his authority due to the time that he had on the river. And I bring that up because as now we're transitioning into chapters three and four in Luke's gospel, chapters one and two was all about establishing, if you remember from last week, the lordship of Jesus, that Jesus is Lord. In the face of so many things that were claiming lordship and divinity and power and authority, he, he goes, Jesus is Lord. And so as he goes into chapters three and four, there's two things in particular this morning that Luke wants us to know about the lordship of Jesus. Here's the first one. Following Jesus will challenge parts of us. There's part of our lives, deep parts of our lives that will be exposed and challenged when we say, I believe in Jesus, I'm gonna follow Jesus. But then secondarily, there's a part that he wants to bring up in which we can trust Jesus' expertise and his authority, even though there's aspects of our lives that are going to be challenged. And so with that kind of as our foundation, we're gonna look at the areas of our lives that are going to be challenged. And so if you haven't made it over to chapter three, I'd like you to do that now because Luke opens up and he readdresses what's been going on with John. Now, John the Baptist, as many of us have come to, to know him, the son of Zechariah, who has come out of the wilderness. Now he's immersed. His public ministry is just beginning. And he just comes out of the woods looking crazy and it's time. And he's got this one message and it's a message of preparation in order for the coming Messiah or Jesus. He is technically a herald. And a herald at the time went ahead of a dignitary, more specifically, a king. They went ahead of a king in order that those who were going to receive the king were aware, one, the king's coming. Two, this is what you need to do in order to prepare for his arrival. And so here's the picture. John's at the Jordan, at the River Jordan. People are coming out because this is the compelling message that he's saying. You've got all these different people in chapter three we're gonna be looking at. You've got the crowd, so you've got some teachers, some Pharisees, some, some, some Sadducees. You've got just a generalized crowd. You even have like tax collectors and soldiers that are there. And John's message is this, as we look into chapter three, beginning in verse eight. This is how John starts. He goes, therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance. Okay, that's not typically like language that we use anymore. So, so this, this repentance in our kind of modern day vernacular, this is what he's saying. He goes, look, do the opposite of what you've been doing. There's a way that you're going. Repentance is a 180 degree change of what you're doing. So he goes, there's a way that we go about certain things in our lives. And he's basically saying, look, do the opposite of what you're inclined to do. And as we hear that message, we should ask ourselves, well, what exactly, what exactly does that mean? And what are those things? And as we look at this dialogue that he's going to have in chapter three, verses one through 15, we see there's three specific areas our lives are going to be challenged on a deep core level as we decide to follow Jesus. And these areas are gonna be our faith, our things, our stuff, and our power. Our faith, our things, and our power are going to be what is challenged as we follow Jesus. And so let's look at our faith first. As he's opening it up, he's telling everybody to repent, to be consistent with the behaviors of the soon coming Messiah. But you have a group of people who are ethnic Jews, and their response is, we have Abraham as our father. That's their response. 
hey, they're like, we're grandfathered into this whole faith thing. Like that promise from Abraham just kind of trickles down to us. And John goes, no. Just because by proximity of your family relation, uh, God will make the stones cry out and have children of his own that follow him. And the thing that we understand in his explanation of this is this, that a decision to follow Jesus and our faith has to be one of an individual intent that nobody can do that for you. Nobody can make that decision for you. Living and growing up in a Christian household, maybe your parents took you to church every single week, you went to all the camps, you did all the things, but just because you were in a Christian household doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. I like how one guy said at one time, he goes, being near Christians doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. Just because you're around it, you don't just get it by osmosis. Like We can pass down things from generation to generation, and we can teach faith, but at some point, each of us are going to have to wrestle with who we believe Jesus is, and then subsequently how we respond to him. We either receive him and then submit to him, or we reject him and depart from him. Fact of the matter is, there was a group of people going, yeah, but... Like, we're in by lineage. And John goes, no, that's not how this works. So Jesus is going to challenge the way that we look at faith, that we all have to come to a place that we make a decision. The next thing he, he does is, is he shows us that Jesus is gonna challenge our things. Because the crowds that are listening are then asking this question. Here's the question that they ask. You can see it in the text. They go, well, then what should we do? If we're to be consistent in keeping with repentance, what should we do? And in so many different ways, this is what John says. He says, share, share your things. And what's great is the emphasis isn't necessarily on the action. The emphasis is on our perspective of the things that we have. Did you catch that? It's not necessarily on the action, but on the perspective of the things that we have because However we see our things, in the end, our things are simply just what? Things. It's just stuff. But for some reason, we'll have this emotional connection to things that we've sacrificed for that thing. That thing gives me something that's specific for me. But you know what? The reality about our things is we try to squeeze out of them something they're not designed to give us. And it might be, I don't know, fill in the blank. And so as I was preparing this one particular point, I remember exactly where I'm sitting in my office. I'm like, yeah, things can have like a stronghold. And the Lord was like, yeah, like that watch. I was like, I'm not talking about me. Like, this is my message I'm preparing. The Lord's like, like that watch. So, give you a little insight. A handful of years ago, my dad gave me a really expensive watch that he had received as a retirement gift, and he just always knew that I thought it was great, and I always connected it to him, and it just means so much, and he gave it to me. He was like, I want you to have it. And man, I was like, this is so cool. And I keep it in my closet. Every time I see it, like, I see, like, I think of dad. Well, my oldest, a handful of years ago, wanted to wear this watch for prom. He's like, Dad, can I, can I wear Poppy's watch? And I was like, no. And he's like, why not? And I was like, because you could like ding it up or scratch it or lose it or something. And he was like, I won't. And I go, I know you won't because you're not wearing it to prom. I guarantee you that's not going to happen because you're not taking it anywhere. A couple years goes by, my middle is ready for prom. He's like, hey, Dad. I know you didn't let that one kid, you know, wear, but you'll let me wear, you know, Poppy's watch, right? I was like, no. He's like, come on. I was like, "Mm mm-mm. He's like, why? I go, I don't know, like you could lose it or scratch it or, you know, something could happen to it. He goes, I promise it won't. I go, I guarantee you it won't because it's not leaving my closet. And as I'm putting this point together, I realized the Lord was like, what is your issue with this thing? 
Like, for some reason, you've got to hold on to it, and you're not letting go of it, and you're stealing joy that they could be experiencing in it, only to put this thing in a closet, only to look at it occasionally. Wouldn't it be that much more significant if they had had that opportunity? Wouldn't it be that much more significant for them to be able to experience that? And what's the worst thing that could happen? So it gets broken, so it gets, you know, scratched up, so it isn't how you are able to control this thing in your life. And I was like, well, why, like, don't get all in me convicting me about my things. Because sometimes we can have a skewed perspective of our things. Things aren't bad. Hear me, hear me say that. Like things aren't bad. It just depends on our perspective that we have about our things. Because this is what we do. We look at them to give us lasting, just fill in the blank for you, lasting joy, lasting significance, lasting hope, for me and this watch, and I know my youngest who hasn't gone to prom yet is watching this, and he's gonna be like, I get to wear it. <laughs> da, 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 da. But we look at these things, and for me, it was like lasting control. And the thing about our things is they're just things. And what they do provide is short lived and it's not lasting. And that's what John was telling those when they're like, well, what should we do with the stuff that we have? And he goes, share, share. It's a differing perspective about the way that we see our things. And not only does he challenge us on our faith, not only does he challenge us on our things, he challenges us on our power. See, there was another group of people, there were tax collectors and there were soldiers. And in both instances, he had one message. Whatever power that you have, don't abuse it. He said to the tax collectors, don't take more than you're supposed to. To the soldiers, he said, don't go by intimidation and or make false accusations in order to get what you want. And the reality is all of us have a degree of power over somebody or in some sphere. And you go, well, I'm not a tax collector, I'm not a soldier, I'm, I'm not a person of significance or anything. Yes, you are. We all have a degree of power. It's just what that looks like and what sphere. Students, let me just say this. Students, in whatever situation that you're in, your power can be you abstaining from saying the thing that the group of kids are saying about the kid that everybody picks on. By you not saying anything, you're demonstrating a sense of power that you're stopping the belittling of another human being that's worthy of honor and respect. Now your friends might be like, why aren't you joining in? Because you have a degree of power and with that power comes responsibility. And with that responsibility, you can change the course of potentially somebody's life. You can be that one person that sticks up for them when nobody else would. That's the power and the sphere that God's placed you in. Parents, we have, we have power as parents. That's significant. That's weighty. So the way that we teach them and love them and direct them and guide them and counsel them and discipline them and, and, and hope for them and whatever that, that is, we have to realize that there cannot be an abuse of that power. Because parenting's a hard job, amen? It's so much easier to step back and just watch chaos ensue. Just let it, when you gotta get up and you gotta get involved and you've got to respond as opposed to reacting and, and you've sometimes gotta listen and then, uh, not abuse of powers to double down and say that you're right when you know that you were wrong. Because I'll tell you some of the most powerful moments I've had with my boys is when I have to come circle back around and go, guess what? Dad was wrong. Dad was wrong, will you forgive me? You're like, you can't do that to your... Yes, you can. It's okay. They don't think less of you. They'll think more of you. Parents, we, we have power. Employees, you have power. The execution of your responsibilities in whatever job that you have. That's a degree of power that conveys your reliability and your faith to your employer when they can trust you, that you follow through, that you're gonna do what you say that you're gonna do, that you're gonna do it with the utmost of excellence, whether somebody is lording it over you or not, that's power. Bosses in the room who organize and lead a bunch of people are the people that you lead just cogs in a wheel to produce something at the end, or are they people, or are they people that you see, that you realize that you've got to love and, and nurture, like you've got power. And what John wants to go is, look, 
As we follow Jesus, some of these deep core things of our life, our faith, the way that we see what it looks like to follow Jesus, that's challenged. Our things, man, our, our perspective of the stuff that we have, that's challenged. The power that we sometimes get drunk on and think that we can just manipulate things to get, that's challenged. And I'll tell you, when some of these core things get challenged, it could easily result in a little sense of intimidation, right? You go, oh man, this following Jesus thing, that's gonna be tough. I feel like it's challenging more than anything else. But here's what's great. Luke now turns his attention to doubling down and really expounding for us the scope of Jesus's authority. You, you know, if we heard the challenge, it's like the difference of us going rafting on the new river and the guy telling us everything that was going to happen. And he was like, all right, you guys, have fun. And he didn't get in the boat with us. That'd be terrifying. As opposed to now the guy with the expertise and the authority saying, I'm riding with you guys and let's go. And that's what Luke does. He goes, now here's the authority by which we have confidence in not only the things that Jesus is going to challenge, but in who he is. And the first thing he starts with is assuring us the authority that Jesus shows us in the word of God. In this book that we have, Jesus' first demonstration that Luke shows for us is the authority that Jesus places in this book. And so turn your attention to Luke 4, 4, 4, 8, 4, 10, and we'll see what happens. So, ending in chapter 3, Jesus is baptized. It's the inauguration of his public ministry. The first thing that happens is the Holy Spirit leads him in the wilderness to be tempted. Here's another lesson within the lesson about temptation. The devil didn't come to Jesus until day 40 in the wilderness. Have you ever heard this acronym? Halt, hurt, angry, lonely, tired. It's the times that we're most susceptible to temptation. And all of us, some of you might be like, well, that's, I'm, I, I make bad decisions with all of those. Like my staff knows if I'm hungry, feed that man. Somebody get him some food because don't have a meeting with him, I'm not gonna make any decisions. Some theologians have said sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do is take a nap. Some of us are tired. Some of us make the worst decisions that we've ever made when we're exhausted or lonely or angry. But this is what we see in the midst of this. Jesus demonstrates for us an authority that we have available to us in the face of anything. Chapter, verse four, but Jesus answered him, it is written, Verse eight, Jesus answered him, it is written. Verse 10, it is written. With every temptation of the evil one, Jesus shows us the authority of the word of God, which we all have. And why is that important for us to know? Here it is. There's nothing that we will face that the Bible doesn't cover. You realize that? There's nothing that we're going to face in the midst of our human condition that the one who created us doesn't cover within the scripture. The truth of the matter is, however, lots of well-intentioned Jesus followers don't know what God's word says. And so when I encourage you, like, get into God's word, get into it and know it. It's not for this, like, obligatory task that you have to do. It's in order for you to be able to hear God's voice for you and in your life so that you're prepared because there are so many things that we're all going to face. We're all gonna face temptation in this world, right? Yeah. One of my favorite passages, 1 Corinthians 10, it's like no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up underneath the trial. I mean, that is amazing. So there is never, this is tough, but that's the truth. But many times we like to acquiesce to we're like, it was just, well, the temptation was just so great. I just, I just caved. You made a decision. If we all thought about it for a second, there's never been a temptation where at the same time you didn't know that there was a way out. You are filled with the same Holy Spirit that I am, that every believer before us and around us is filled with. And when there's that temptation, there's always an option out. You know, when you get on a plane, what's the first thing that happens when you get on a plane? Before you ever start to, to move, before we ever take off, they're like, in the event of an emergency, right? 
This is what you gotta do. This is how you get off this thing that flies. And that's, they're telling you, so you don't panic, so you're prepared if it goes crazy, which, okay, sidebar. I always think it's a little funny. It's a little funny when they're like, in the event of a water landing, your seat cushion can become a flotation device. That brings me no comfort whatsoever. If I'm going from 35,000 feet to a body of water, I'm like, well, I'm about to meet Jesus and somebody's gonna float along with this cushion because it's not gonna be me. So anyway, <laughs> we're gonna deal with temptation, we're gonna deal with suffering, we're gonna deal with loss. The realization is the comforting words of God to us about all those, there's authority right here. That's not saying it's the only authority. There are lots of things that have been created that help us in those times. But the truth, the truth of the God who loves us and leads us he has spoken to all these things. It's just a matter of whether we know them or not. And so when I say get in your Bible, it's to know the truth is then to apply the truth and see the authority of the truth in the situations in which we live. He also shows us, Luke shows us, the authority in his teaching, in Jesus' teaching, verses 31 and 32. Then he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. So he went into a synagogue. They were astonished, they being the teachers of the law, Sadducees and Pharisees at the time, astonished at his teaching because his message had authority. There, there was a difference in what Jesus was saying. I mean, teachers can inform, right? And teachers can inspire. And teachers can instruct. And teachers can convey information. But there was something about Jesus that he was conveying a sense of authority in what he said. And you know why that's significant for us? We can trust it. We can trust what Jesus says, even as radical or as difficult as it might be. And one of my fan favorites is when Jesus goes, hey, um, love your enemies and pray for them. No. Anybody ever truthful? You read something, Jesus says, you're like, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna do that. I wanna harbor some anger and some resentment. Well, how's that doing for your soul? Because right now, think about somebody that you hate. When has anybody ever asked you to do that in church? That is so like counterintuitive. You're like, today I figured out who it is I really hate in church, it's awesome. Now, now, I challenge you, I challenge you this, this week, as you think of that person, in the words of Jesus, he says, um, love your enemy, love them, but how? And pray for them. You're like, oh man, mm, I don't know if I wanna do that. I don't know if I wanna do that. You might not even know how to do that. You might not even know what that looks like. So here's the challenge this, this week, as that person pops into your mind, and you just wanna, ooh, you just wanna harbor, you just wanna sit and soak like a nasty hot tub in all the emotions and feelings that you have. You go, fine, I'm gonna pray for him. And you go, but what am I supposed to pray? Hey, just start by going, okay, Lord, I don't wanna sit in this anger and frustration. Teach me how or what to pray for them because here's what we think is going to happen, that God is going to change them. When more times than not, he ends up changing something about us. He lets us let go and, and release things that are just toxic in our lives. And so we see the authority in his teaching. We also see, and Luke is painting this, this picture. It's like, man, Jesus is Lord. And here's the breadth of his authority. He also shows us the authority Jesus has over the spiritual, the spiritual realm. Look at this in verses 35 and 36. But Jesus rebuked him and said, when it says him, this is a demon, a demon in a person. And this is not language that we use because we're like westernized, post-enlightenment, you know, we're so smart that we don't believe in some sort of spiritual realm. I'm here to break it down for you. Uh, we think that we live in a naturalistic world that has supernatural occurrences when the truth is we live in a supernatural world and we have naturalistic eyes that are incapable of seeing the majority of what's happening around us. That's the truth. And all of a sudden, Jesus rebukes this demon and he says, be silent. Now, why do you tell him to be silent? Well, you'll read that the demons were affirming who Jesus was. This demon goes, I know who you are. 
you're the holy one of God. And Jesus was like, shut your mouth. Is it? Not now. It's not time. It's not ready. They acknowledged him. Be silent and come out of him. And throwing him down before them, the demon came out of him without hurting him at all. Amazement came over them all. And they were saying to one another, what is this message? For he commands the unclean spirits with authority and power, and they come out. Man, he shows the authority of the word of God. He shows authority in what he says. Now he shows authority in the unseen world that many times we don't really have any sort of association with. And it's hard for us to categorize and wrap our minds around. And so what does that do for us? That should instill in us a sense of confidence that even though we don't understand it, we can't control it, Jesus still has authority over it. And that is something about this world We've got to realize that there is a spiritual struggle happening around us. And for us not to know that reality is to be susceptible to that reality. But in the midst of it, we're not supposed to be filled with fear or intimidation, but confidence that just because we don't get it, we don't see it, we can't fathom it, Jesus still has authority over it, amen? But he doesn't stop there. And this is what I love about what's happening in this section of Luke. He goes, I want you to see that he's got authority over everything, including he has authority over the physical. He goes on to say this. After he left the synagogue, he entered Simon's house, Simon Peter. Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up immediately and began to serve them. Luke's point is for us, after the establishment of the lordship of Jesus, he says, now I want you to see the scope of the authority of Jesus. From everything the Old Testament has said and the power that he shows us is there, from the things that he says, to the unseen world, to the physical world, he's got authority over it all. And many of us would look at this passage and go, well, if he's got authority over the physical, then then why are there still infirmities? And then why hasn't he healed those now? And I'm here to tell you, it's not necessarily going to happen in the time in which we would want it to happen, but rest assured, at one point, and at some time in the future, we will all be healed. That is something we can guarantee. That is the truth of the scripture we hold on to. But many times, we want God to do it the way we want it done in the time frame that we want it done in. True? And so we end up turning Jesus into like a divine butler. Do it now. Do it this way. And he goes, there's some things you don't understand. And the reality is, our world's infected because of sin. And it's broken. Things aren't the way they were supposed to be. We're not supposed to die. We're not supposed to have these infirmities. We're not supposed to have these things. But we have hope that one day it's going to all be set right. And Jesus goes, there's going to be some challenges in your lives. But I have the authority in the midst of that. As we were going down the New River, at the end of the day, we, you know, we stopped and we had lunch, and, and it freaked me out in a couple situations. Like, it was fun, it was challenging, it was terrifying, we had a blast. But what our raft guide said at the beginning really was true. He said, look, just because this is your first time down these rapids, it's not my first time. And in one particular, it was a category four. And as we're going around the bend, I didn't realize that you could see a horizon on a river, and that was terrifying. I was like, the river is just gone ahead of us. And he said, I need you to listen to me closely, and his tone changed. And he goes, we need to get to the left. Every time I say stroke, you do it. When I say go backwards, you do it. You sit where I tell you to go sit, because just because you haven't been through it doesn't mean I can't navigate you around it. Just because it looks intimidating to you doesn't mean I can't get you through it. And as we look at what Luke is doing, as we look and establish the lordship of Jesus, and we look at the scope of his authority, we go, yes, my faith will be challenged. Yes, my things will be challenged. Yes, there'll be challenges to my power. But we have hope and confidence in the one who has authority. And he goes, look, this might be and is the only life you'll live, but you know what? 
It's not news to me. It's not a new thing for me. And as we navigate these waters of life and we see a horizon on a river that doesn't feel like it needs to be there, we can have confidence in the one who will guide us through. Even if it doesn't feel like there's a way through, we'll make it through. Jesus has the authority. We have confidence in that. Lord, thank you. That even though there's things that we don't get and and things that really get to us on a core level that challenges aspects of it, that you have the authority to provide, you have the authority to navigate us, you have the authority in which we have hope and trust and confidence in you. And it takes the hope and trust and confidence off ourselves, realizing that we can't do that. We can't navigate it. We've never seen it. We've never been here before, but it's not new to you. Just because it's new to us doesn't mean it's new to you. So Lord, I pray that we would rest assured and find confidence in your authority. In Jesus' name, amen.